Next one is, let's see, Winter Moratorium. So it's the second slide on the third page. This one's way easier. Again, I want to emphasize Winter Moratorium is summarized on the yellow sheet. So all you really need is the calendar, which proves itself, and a financial hardship form. But there are a few things worth knowing. So as a matter of law, the Winter Moratorium says, no electric or gas company shall shut off or fail to restore uh, utility service between the dates of November 15th and March 15th um, when there's a financial hardship and the utility service is heat related. So let me tell you about heat related and the calendar and a few other things. Um, again, practice is often better than the law. Under the law, if you use gas for your stove, your gas service could be shut off in the winter even if you're low income because that's not heat related. I mean, yes, you can turn your stove on, but that's not your heating system. And for tenants where the landlord provides the heat, the electricity and gas are not heat related. You could be living in the dark, not able to cook your food, but your, the heat's coming up from the basement from the landlord. So technically they could shut that uh, utility service off. In practice, Many of the utility companies don't shut off residential customers in the coldest months of the winter, period. They just don't do it. Um, because obviously there can be low income customers who the company doesn't know are low income. And although they would be legally correct in shutting those people off because they hadn't asserted their low income status, they don't want someone to die because it's so cold. So they tend to stay away from shutoffs in the winter for a lot of the months. Uh, this may be, I don't know, certain, it may be particularly true of the gas companies because way more people heat with gas. By the way, if you pay for your heat, your electric account is protected because if you're running your own heating system, there's thermostats or there's a furnace fan or there's circulating pumps on a hot water system that has circulating pumps, so your electricity is protected. But I just want you to know, generally you won't see shutoffs um, in that November 15th to March 15th period, but you may and it would be legal. Um, now, for the November 15th to March 15th period, for the last several years, um, the department has extended the March 15th date, often at the request of, of my office. They just did so. We put in a request early March, and on March 5th, they sent letters to all the companies asking them to extend the winter moratorium. Um, so, uh, and I should say 2010. Uh, so. Uh, Three of the big companies or three of the companies have sent in letters already, but I think they're all sending in letters. So you shouldn't see shutoffs um, until after April 15th, and we covered the schedule earlier. Um, if you hear of a company that is, n is not honoring that, that's threatening a shutoff before April 15th, let me know. Um, Technically, of course, the, the, the rule says the companies would have to restore terminated service. So if they terminated after November 15th and you could prove your client was low income, it would get restored. I haven't seen them terminate people after November 15th, so I, don't, I think all you need to know is your clients are protected during the winter moratorium. Um, to do so, to get the protection, they need to put in the same financial hardship form we just discussed. Uh, so this is a good point to say, well, how do people, most people actually don't put in financial hardship forms. If you are on fuel assistance, you will usually get the financial hardship protection, and I say usually for the following reason. If you heat with oil, obviously the fuel assistance agency doesn't have to capture your electric and gas account number, they're paying your oil bill. They will ask you to produce your electric and gas account number, but if your client for some reason doesn't follow up, there's no way in the world they, a company knows that your client's getting fuel assistance, they're not gonna be coded as financial hardship. Under the regulations, however, if you're on financial hardship, they have to keep you on through that entire heating season through to the next uh, December, I believe it is. So this is better than putting in a financial hardship form, which is only good for 90 days. Uh, so you, 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 it's always good to make sure your client is coded as financial hardship because even if you know they get fuel assistance, unless you know with 100% certainty they turned in their electric and gas account number, the company's not going to know. They're not going to be protected. So financial hardship is pretty straight ahead. Any questions on that one? And you can get that information if they're quoted from the company. company. 
Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like the discount rate. I, I don't see a downside. Uh, when I talked about what's the status of the account, I would use those words. You don't want to obviously provoke the company to focus on your client and send the truck. These are perfectly safe. I'd call up and say, is my client coded as financial hardship? I think all the companies use that lingo. It's literally a code on the account, and they can tell you. Um, and the other thing I think most companies could tell you, is it coded because of fuel assistance, and then you don't have to worry about the 90-day clock? Or is it coded because your client put in an actual financial hardship form, and then you do have to worry about the 90-day clock? It's going to need to be renewed. Again, financial hardship, um, whenever you apply, so you could apply in November of 2009, it's good through December of 2010, you don't have to renew it. Um, that is, the department has taken the approach, if you're on fuel assistance, you're probably fuel assistance year to year, we're going to give you into the beginning of the next heating se season to reapply for fuel assistance. Okay, um, so winter moratorium. Um, next is infant. Um, the rules changed in the last year to the better, so um, I'll make sure to cover that. Again, the uh, summary of the rule is on your yellow sheet. On the orange sheet, you get a little more discussion of infant protection um, and uh, cite to the regulations. But what the rule says is that no electric gas company shall shut off or fail to restore service when there's an infant under the age of 12 months and a financial hardship. Uh, so again, this is one of the three protections where you need financial hardship. We know how to prove that. The regs on proving uh, age are pretty good. They are on page 69. So if you look at the last paragraph on page 69, there's a bold heading, Procedure for Certifying Protections. Um, and then B, the last paragraph, uh, second sentence says, certification may be in the form of a birth certificate or a letter or official documents issued by a registered physician, local board of health, hospital or government official, department of transitional assistance, clergyman, or religious institution. What that's basically saying is anything reasonable works. And so this may be valuable. You may have clients who had an infant that was born in another country, so they have a piece of paper that doesn't easily fit in one of those categories, but it looks reasonable. Anything works that really looks reasonable to you. By the way, I, I'm looking for one other thing. All right, here's another thing wrong with the New England gas form. If you could go back to page 91, page 89 is numbered, and then just flip over. Uh, at, the, at the very top of 91, there's that form that says financial hardship, other protections. The second checkbox says, I am a Massachusetts resident with a financial hardship and there is a child under 12 months. Everybody see what's in parentheses after that? Anything wrong with what's in parentheses? Page 91, the second checkbox. Anything wrong with that, folks? Right. It's specifically saying you must give us a birth certificate. I just read you a regulation that had six or seven things that are good enough. Another example, don't always believe or assume that a company's form is in compliance with the law. Um, so on this one in particular, I, I want to stress anything that looks reasonable should be good. And the department, I think, has made it clear that you can't require a birth certificate. Obviously, it's the good one, and everyone accepts a birth certificate, but anything else is reasonable. Now, the, the way the rules got better, uh, again, this is one of those protections, like many of them, says, thou shalt not shut off or fail to restore. So one question we had um, was, well, what if the kid was born after the termination? So when I was doing this training two years ago, I said, you know what? that termination was legal when it occurred. There was no infant in the house, and you don't get restored just because you had an infant. That used to be the rule. The department changed the rule a year ago. Said, if there's an infant in the house, you get restored, period. Doesn't matter when the infant was born. So you can be shut off, you're eight months pregnant, let's say. And a month later, there's an infant in the household. The service gets restored. You can be shut off a month ago, and your sister moves into your house with an infant, BHA doesn't know the infants in the household, but for the utility rules, household is the very layperson's notion of the household. Who is in the house? Okay? So in that situation, now, I mean, obviously, 
things can happen on the housing side that are bad. I assume most of you know enough about BHA rules. I, I shouldn't say BHA in particular, any housing authority. Um, the person's in the household, they're in the household, so the rule got better. Uh, so it's important to know that piece in case you'd heard about the infant rule before. Um, this one's really easy to prove. Um, I have rarely, if ever, seen a problem. You don't deal with munis, but um, some of the smaller municipal light plants will um, say, ah, but we know the housing authority doesn't know you have the infant, so we're going to go to the housing authority. Or we, we know the landlord's not aware of all the kids that are living in the house. I think that's illegal, and you won't see that with the big utilities. They don't, one is they don't know their customers that well, and two is they don't stoop to that level of kind of pushing back against uh, the assertion of infant protection. Um, 